Hi, everyone. My name is Grace, and I'm the events producer at University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington. I'd like to welcome you all to the first event in our new series, Julia Quinn Presents. Let us know in the chat where you're all zooming in from. Thank you all for supporting a local independent bookstore. University Bookstore is the oldest independent bookstore in the region. In fact, we're celebrating our 121st anniversary this year. And we couldn't have weathered the pandemic without all the love from our authors and you, our longtime and brand new customers alike. So our heartfelt thank you to you all. With tens of millions of copies in print, number one New York Times bestselling author Julia Quinn has been called smart and funny by Time Magazine. Her novels have been translated into 35 languages and are beloved the world over. And of course, I'm sure we're all binging or have binged the Bridgertons on Netflix. A graduate of Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges, she lives with her family in the Pacific Northwest. Julia has been a friend of University Bookstore for a very long time. We've hosted her for many in-person events and being her home store, we're also where she comes in to sign books. We have a giant area set up in our lower floor that is reserved only for the fulfillment of the many hundreds of her books that we ship out. She can be found at our store so often signing books that we decided that it was time to make her an honorary University Bookstore employee. Julia has been a champion of our store and a champion of literacy, promoting our partnership with Northwest Literacy Foundation to help donate books to kids who need them. So we are honored to put together this series in her name and thrilled to be hosting two more events this year in which she'll be in conversation with various romance authors. The next one will be in early August. So please follow University Bookstore and Julia Quinn on social media to keep updated. We're gonna start this event with a moderated discussion with Julia in conversation with our panelists, followed by a Q&A of audience questions. So if you have a question, and I know you have many, many questions, please write it in the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen at any time during the event, and we'll gather them all to be asked after the moderated portion. And I know many of you have bundled books together for all of the authors, but if at any time during this um, presentation, you also want to add some more, feel free to do so. We have people working at the bookstore who are going to add those to your order, so you're not going to be charged twice for shipping. The first panel today features historical romance with authors Eloisa James, Joanna Shoup, and Denny S. Bryce. Eloisa James is a US Today and New York Times bestselling author and professor of English literature who lives with her family in New York, but can sometimes be found in Paris or Italy. She's a mother of two and in a particularly delicious irony for a romance writer, is married to a genuine Italian knight. Joanna Shoup has always loved history ever since she saw her first Schoolhouse Rock cartoon. In 2013, she won Romance Writers of America's prestigious Golden Heart Award for Best Historical. Since then, her books have appeared on numerous yearly best of lists, including Publishers Weekly, The Washington Post, Kirkus Reviews, Kobo, and Bookpage. She lives in New Jersey with her two spirited daughters and dashing husband. Denny S. Bryce is an award-winning author and three-time RWA Golden Heart finalist, including twice for Wild Women in the Blues. In addition to writing for NPR books and frolic media, the former professional dancer is a public relations professional who has spent over two decades running her own marketing and event management firm. A member of the Historical Novel Society, Women's Fiction Writers Association and Novelists Inc., she's a frequent speaker at author events. Originally from Chicago, she now lives in Savannah, Georgia. As I mentioned, we'll be dropping links in to purchase copies of all the books periodically in the chat for your convenience. And now I'll turn it over to our panelists for the day. Hey, everybody. Hi. Yeah. Hello. So this is exciting. I want to thank you guys for coming to the first ever Julia Quinn Presents and to Grace for coming up with the idea. Um, this is actually the first time I've done something like this where like I'm leading the conversation. So I was trying to think about what I would want to know about you guys. And so I'm going to ask a question that I know some of the answer to, but maybe not all of it. And I thought it'd be really interesting to hear like your writing journey, like what led you to 
that first book sale? Like, where did you go and stuff? And so I'm either going to go from like the person with the longest publishing career to the shortest or the other way around, which means Joanna, you're definitely in the middle. I'm in the middle. Yay. <laughs> right. <laughs> so I don't know whether I don't know who to put on the spot. Um, all right, Denny shrugged. I'm going to start with Denny because she's new. Um, in fact, so new that her debut book officially comes out in two days. In two, um, yes, on Tuesday, um, mm -hmm. March 30th. And the name of my book is Wild Women in the Blues, my debut historical fiction novel. I'm sort of sneaking in here with the historical yeah. romance authors, which is actually a good place to be. And uh, going back to the earliest days of uh, Wild Women in the Blues in particular, because I've written a lot, I actually started with romantic suspense for, for that matter and a lot of paranormal, but I found this recently. It is a 2015 first place for Wild Women in the Blues and the two top judges, professional judges, were Julia Quinn and my current agent, Nalini Akolakar. So this is 2015. I was trying to tell someone that I'd only been working on this book for like three years, but the reality is it's been longer. <laughs> it's been much longer. Um, my writing journey, um, not to talk on forever because that is something I can do, um, really began uh, years ago when uh, part-time, when I get home from my crazy event management job, um, I'd write fan fiction. And writing fan fiction for a decade, uh, primarily I wrote Buffy Spike uh, fan fiction. Uh, that's from hey. Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yeah, not that angel stuff, um, for those who know. And then after a while, a friend of mine who was in RWA, Romance Writers of America, suggested I accompany her to an event um, a conference. And so I used to take my vacations attending conferences and I started to uh, get into the idea of writing what we used to call as a fanfic writer, original fiction. So it's been about 10, 12 years. <laughs> and so we've been working on 10, 12 years. And so at what point did, cause I know that, or at least I think that Wild Women in the Blues at one point started out as historical romance or at least. Absolutely. It definitely started as a historical romance and the uh, uh, impetus to change it to historical fiction actually came from two agents. Mm -hmm. um, my agent, my current agent now, but also another agent from the Knight Agency, uh, both of them many years ago, this is like in 2015, suggested I take a look at historical fiction. Uh, and so um, I started exploring historical fiction. I think it, it's a natural place for me to be because I love it. I love mixing history. I focus on uh, African Americans in the 20th century, early 20th century uh, storytelling and uh, the community in Chicago is in the first story because Wild Women in the Blues is what they call a dual storyline set in 1925 as well as in 2015. In the 2015 story, I have a young man who's a grieving uh, film student who encounters a woman who uh, claims to be 110 years old at a senior living facility in Chicago. And then in um, 1925, um, a woman is a court, a young girl, 19 year old girl is a, um, is a chorus girl with uh, ambitions to be at a really fancy um, place dancing at um, the Dreamland Cafe, which was located on the corner of 35th Street and State Street in Chicago back in the 1920s. So this is where I need to like hop in and tell everybody, and I've told the story before, so some people may know this about like how I actually met you and discovered mm -hmm. your writing. So yes, I was a judge in that contest and I'm glad that you found that plaque because I, I couldn't remember when it was. Yeah. I, I knew it, I knew it was more than five years, but I, I wasn't sure. Anyway, so I, I haven't done this in a while, but I used to judge 
Romance Writers America chapter contests. And by it's chapters in two ways. Usually people submit a chapter of their work, but it's also run by local chapters. And I always thought that if you were gonna, you know, do your entry fee of however much it was, you deserved a little more than some like numerical score at the end that you have no idea what it means. So I actually would spend time and I would mark up and and if I may pat myself on the back, I'm actually a really good editor. And so I would mark things up and it would both be like, you know, awkward sentences or grammar punctuation, but also some thoughts about other stuff. And I get to this entry and I swear to God, my red pen sat completely idle. <laughs> And I was like, okay, I like, there wasn't even like a comma out of place. And I get to, I was like, I got nothing to write here. So finally I just write at the end. I was like, this is amazing and it should be published and I want to read it. And that's all I had to say. And that was Denny's entry. Um, I can honestly say it was the finest thing I've ever judged in a contest. I mean, not that I've judged that many contests, but it's an, I've judged enough. So that is somewhat meaningful. <laughs> and, Thank you. And then, I didn't know your name because it wasn't on there, but a number of years later, you tracked me down at a conference and said, that was me. And I <laughs> totally remembered it because it was so good. And it was also so interesting to me to see, you know, a time period in what was then a historical romance as opposed to historical fiction that I just, I never saw. Yeah. I mean, people weren't writing 20th century. People weren't writing African-American characters. People weren't writing African-American characters in the 20th century. And it just this whole jazz age thing. And so it's just so interesting to me. And I just, I feel like emotionally invested. Like I have like <laughs> a small piece in this book and I'm so excited that the rest of the world is going to get to read it. So. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So now Joanna, you know, you're in the hot seat. I feel like you're, you're in my screen, at least you're in the middle. So you're like Alice on the Brady Bunch here. Oh. Hey. <laughs> okay. Hey, so you can crack jokes, but like maybe if you could tell everybody a little bit about your journey to getting published and sort of a little, and then you can go on to sort of like where you are today too. Because one thing I think is really interesting about your career, like you now write, I'm sort of getting ahead with my questions because I was going to ask people about setting, but um, you write in Gilded Age, New York, but you started out writing Regencies, right? Right. Okay. So maybe. So okay. yeah, I, um, I, I, on a dare after college, my oldest sister dared me to write a romance novel because I read them all the time. And uh, so I was waiting tables at the time after college because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I would come home at you know 2 a.m. and I would write until five and then uh, sleep until one and then go back and wait tables and do the whole thing over again. And pretty soon I had an entire book. So uh, I put it, you know, a couple, my mom read it, thought it was really great. And then, so I put it under the mattress and I kind of left it um, while I went to Chicago to get a real job. And then years later, I moved to New York and the book came with me on multiple hard drives. And I was miserable in my job in New York. And I was dating my now husband and I would come home after work and I would flop on the couch and I would just zone out, like probably wishing the building would collapse on me. I was that miserable. And he, he said, this is bad. Like I'm watching you spiral the drain. Is there anything that you might do that could do that would bring you joy? Like, I really want to help you. Like you got to get out of this funk. And I said, well, I wrote a romance novel, you know, a few years ago, and maybe someday I will get it out and polish it up and try to sell it. And he, I sort of expected him to laugh, but he didn't. And he said, that's amazing. I'll help you get it out. Let's edit it. Let's polish it up. And I'll help you try to get it published. That he was has a all... good move marrying him, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, so yes, for many reasons, but he has, um, he has a lot of editing and uh, writing in his own background. So he did, he, we got it out, we put it together, we edited it, we polished it up. And um, then by that point we were moving out to New Jersey. So I hooked up with the New Jersey romance writers and I had this manuscript that, you know, circled critique partners. And then I started querying agents. And I soon learned that that manuscript needed to be put under the bed, never to be seen again, but fine. Like it was, you know, you got to do it a couple of times until wow. you get it right. So um, then I started working on, I, I had always read Edith Wharton as I loved Edith Wharton growing up. And I fell in love with New York and the Gilded Age and that time period and that place. So I knew though that no publisher would 
take on a Gilded Age story. I mean, yeah. Regency is like the name of the game, right? So I came up with a Regency idea, hoping that I could land a publisher that, and those books might do well enough that the publisher would take a risk and publish Gilded Age. So that's kind of what happened. Like the first series did okay. And I said, they said, what do you want to write next? And I said, well, you know, are you ready? Like I have this idea and you may not, you may not um, like it. And they were very receptive to it. They loved it. They, they said, let's give it a try. Like we have nothing to lose. So um, that's when the first Gilded Age series came out. And it was a little rocky. I don't think a lot of people knew when it was or what it was or, you know, was it romance? Was it not like the covers looked pretty different than a lot of most, um, most romance covers. So uh, yeah, so I just been like plugging away and trying to, to uh, make people know what the Gilded Age is, I guess. What you got okay. there, Danny? No, is this, was it Mogul? So yeah, that's the, uh, that's the third book of the series, but Magnate, okay. Magnate was the first. Oh, right, and right. So, you know, it's just, it's like a guy who looks like the guy from Prison Break. Went yes! with <laughs> I remember seeing that being like, how'd you get the Prison Break guy on there? <laughs> Isn't he amazing? Um, he found me on Facebook, by the way. Um, mm. So uh, yeah, so, the, you know, the covers looked a little different. So it, it took, it was very much an uphill battle, but I feel like with Avon, you know, we've really tried to package mm -hmm. them looking like most every other romance cover. So hopefully readers understand kind of what they are. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. Cause this, the Gilded Age is really the Regency, but like on speed. I mean, there's really <laughs> like no, there's no difference really between the Regency and the Gilded Age other than kind of location. Well, I think so. speed was more readily available in the Gilded Age, probably. Than the yes. <laughs> At yes. least when, when I saw the Nick on TV, that there seemed to be a lot of that. Yes, I love that series. <laughs> yeah, that's good. All right, Eloisa? Um, I, I can fit mine right on to Joanna's because I remember when Magnet came out and everybody was talking about it. I love that book. Thank and, you. Yeah, Thank you. Having a man on the cover when most of them had sort of long dresses. I think it did make you stand out. And plus the books, the guys were great. So thank you. I am a, this is not my past, but I'm right. I just finished a book that has an American hero in it, my first American hero. And it was so much fun going for, I think something you've captured in your books, which is sort of, you know, the bold guy who made all the money. Mine, uh, my favorite scene is the heroine thinks he's going to give her a ring, you know, go down his knees, but he gives her instead a bear tooth mounted on a pendant, <laughs> you know. He's American. He's like a wild west. Yeah, anyway, I might have gone too far. We'll see if it survives <laughs> anything. But anyway, my story is kind of like Joanna's, and then I wrote my first. I tried to write romances when I was a kid, but then I wrote my first one right after college. And my boyfriend at the time had no editing experience, but he was working as a banker, which meant that he had a what we now call an assistant, and she took my book, which was 550 pages of raw passion. It was called Passion Slave. There were like two heroes, you know, there was a shake. The, the heroine fell off the river of Sen. She got almost blinded by a camel with camel spit. So watch it if you ever go to Egypt, because that's true. You know, that was like my only verifiable historical detail in the whole thing. And she sent it everywhere. And, um, and Julie knows this, Julia knows this. My favorite uh, rejection letter was from the Sierra Club. They said it was very frisky. <laughs> They enjoyed it, but it wasn't in their line. So then I went off and I went to grad school and I, I became a professor. But then um, we had one child and I had student loans and I needed to make money. So I wrote my first book that got published to make money. And then kind of like Joanna, it's um, when you're working really hard at one thing and you think, what am I doing for delight in my life? Writing, especially I think writing romance can be that thing. And so for me, it's been a lifelong kind of duality. I'm um, the chair of English right now and I'm teaching Shakespeare, but I just had this happy experience of turning in a book on Friday about the bear tooth <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and my heroine. My heroine is- um, 
Are she you- made all her money on commodes on toilets. So she has got a scandalous fortune. That is Love not it. your first toilet book, but are you going to call it the bear tooth bride? No, <laughs> no, <laughs> but not bad. That's a good idea. If it survives the editing round, I'll I can do something with that. Okay. So I would love to hear, we, and we touched on this a little bit with Joanna, just about the settings that you choose, because it's very different. I mean, Eloise's is mostly Regency or Georgian, which is very similar to Regency in a lot of, I mean, there are little differences, but in terms of the way we present them to readers, it's pretty similar. But both Denny and Joanna are writing in times that are not typical within historical romance. Um, but Denny's, again, is historical fiction, but we take her, we accept her. Yay. To be part of us. Uh, so yeah, I would love to hear just a little bit more about what you love about that time period. And I'm going to start with Joanna simply because somebody asked a question and I don't want to forget. Oh, did we drop someone? Hmm. Oh, looks like we dropped someone for a second. I don't want to forget. Um, somebody asked if you could define Knickerbocker. Well, sure. Um, Knickerbocker started out as sort of a derogatory term for mm -hmm. the wealthy New Yorkers, the upper class who could trace their roots back to the Dutch who settled the island of Manhattan. So it started out as kind of a, a derogatory term, but then evolved into just a way to kind of, um, you know, refer to the, the upper crust of, of New York City. So, you know, and over the years, it's become really a way to talk about New York, like the basketball team, Knicks really stands for Knickerbockers. Nice. So do you know where the actual word came from? Like the etymology of it? I do. Um, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it was, it was um, based on like a character that was created, a cart, I believe it's a cart, like a cartoon character that was drawn to like make fun of those um, upper crust people. I think, and I think the word is probably Dutch, you know, some sort of, yeah. Well, so can you tell us just a little bit more about what you like about the Gilded Age? What made you want to write there, I guess, instead of say the Regency, which would have been, you know, the more marketable, safer way to go? For sure. For sure. Um, so, uh, like I said, I loved Edith Wharton. My ancestors also came through Ellis Island um, in the late 19th century um, Mine too. from Italy. Yay. Well, um, and also Castle Garden, I learned, which came before Ellis before Island. Before it was Ellis Island. It was called yeah. Castle Garden. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, for me, um, I've always felt an affinity for not only New York, but that time period. And I love, I've always loved American history. So the Gilded Age is really when America as we know it becomes, you know, it's really when the America that we know forms. It's, um, you know, it's all the, the big money. It's the infrastructure of all the, you know, the cities becoming the cities. Um, it's, you know, all the corruption and politics, the uh, immigration coming in from Europe and around the world. But most importantly, it's when women sort of gain a huge leap forward in independence. Mm -hmm. uh, before the Gilded Age, it was an industrial society, a farming society. You would have been raised on your parents' farm. You would have met a neighboring farm boy. You would have moved to a farm and you would have farmed the end. So then in the Gilded Age, we see because of the rise of you know, offices and department stores and sort of cities forming, there are now jobs for women where they can come in off the farms and find jobs in the city. They can live alone. They can make their own money. They can get around um, on public transportation. So it's really just this huge leap forward in uh, independence for women. And that for me is, I mean, it's just rich, full of these great careers for heroines, these great, like, you know, rebellious women, these like really smart, industrious people that I can use for stories. Cool. Um, that's really neat. And then in the, I have to confess, I haven't read The Heiress Hunt, but isn't she a tennis player? Yes, yeah. Okay. That's when we really start to see also in the Gilded Age, professional tennis, professional golf, professional baseball, all of that 
really starts to happen in the Gilded Age because the middle class has more time and money for leisure. So um, yeah, so professional sports really, really becomes a thing. And I, I was gonna, um, I originally wanted to write a series that was Gilded Age baseball, mm-hmm. but there didn't seem to be much love for Gilded Age baseball in the world. So uh, I decided, okay, well, I'll have the heroine be a, a baseball pitcher, but it was just not working for the story. And so I said, okay, I want her to be an athlete. I'm going to make her a tennis player. So I want you to know how difficult it was for me not to make a there's no crying in baseball. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Denny, can you tell us what drew you to Jazz Age Chicago? Well, um, several factors, starting with the years I spent in Chicago, um, just had a love-hate relationship with the city, a lot of love, but you know there were challenges during the time I was living there. Um, but if I go back to the true roots, it has to do with my maternal grandmother. She came to this country from uh, Montego Bay, Jamaica in 1923 and went immediately to um, a small town in Ohio when she thought she was going to be living in New York City. So Mm -hmm. she kept a lot of photos of herself back in the 20s. Even when I was a little girl, I'd just look up and stare and was like, what were you doing there, Grandma? You know, Mm -hmm. stuff like that. And she'd tell me stories about how she didn't get to do the things she (laughs) thought she was going to do. And then um, another factor that was pretty important um, in in shaping um, the story and the setting had to do with a woman I met in New York. Uh, When I was a professional dancer, as many professional dancers tend to do, I waited on tables. And one of the places that I worked at was called The Cookery, um, which was a blues jazz joint in the village. And um, the headliner, during the time I was there was a woman who was relaunching her career at the age of 83 or 84. Her name was Alberta Hunter. And Mm -hmm. she actually had, I actually put her, sprinkled her through Wild Women in the Blues. The connection between Alberta and I in New York was that we were both from Chicago. And my job every time she played was to bring her tea. And so that, allowed me to get to know her. The other aspect um, of why I set the story in Chicago in particular is Chicago's rich music history. Um, And it's the Chicago Black Renaissance um, is sometimes, well, oftentimes um, gets second city billing, if you will, to the Harlem Renaissance, when at the time there was so much going on in the city in terms of everything from music to the arts, um, to banks opening and just a lot of activity in um, small community, in a small land space. Because one of the things that happened during the 1920s, well, post-World War I, was the migration of uh, African-Americans from the South to escape Jim Crow to Northern cities. Chicago was one of the hotbeds of come here for opportunity. But one of the other things that existed was that you had uh, only a certain amount of blocks where blacks could live uh, because of something called redlining and prejudice and racism and all the other things. So you go from having a community that's maybe this big with this much space to this big in this much space. So there were a lot of challenges during the time period. And I wanted to explore them because so often um, the 1920s story looks a lot like the Great Gatsby and there are other stories to be told for that time period. That's so cool. And what I'm curious, because this isn't something I know a whole lot about. Although when you're talking, it reminded me that there's a book I've been meaning to read called The Warmth of Other Suns by Isabel Wilkerson. Okay. I'm not familiar with that. I'm oh, familiar it's, it's, with uh, Isabel Wilkerson, but yeah, not. she's a book out now called Cast, which I'm actually right. Interested. Right. Her previous book was called The Warmth of Other Suns, and I think it was all about the Great Migration. And you're just making me want to read that one. Um, I don't know. Maybe Grace can put the link for that one up there too. Um, mm-hmm. But oh, somebody has read it and said, <laughs> "Thank you." 
Um, but was there, in terms of like the music scene in Chicago versus the music scene in New York, was there anything sort of like that really kind of differentiated them that made them fundamentally different? Yes, there, to me, from the history that I've read, as well as some of my experiences in Chicago, a lot of the New Orleans jazz artists traveled from New York, I mean, traveled from New Orleans, which is Storyville time, turn of the century, and then they shut down Storyville and traveled north to Chicago. And some of that had to do with the Chicago Defender a newspaper, one of the oldest Black newspapers that was instrumental in really um, it, encouraging Blacks in the South to escape Jim Crow and come to Chicago um, and to Northern City. So those um, elements and the music scene that came to the city on State Street uh, called The Stroll, there was just so much happening with me. You had some fabulous musicians as well um, who just sort of made Chicago their first stop. Many made it their home, um, like Lil Hardin, who is was a jazz pianist and but is somewhat only known as being a Louis Armstrong second wife, but she had a fabulous career all her own um, before she met uh, Louis Armstrong. Cool. Well, thank you. Okay. So my question for Eloisa um, is also has to do with setting, but so you've written in both the Regency and the Georgian period, mm -hmm. but I think you've done more in the Georgian period, right? I don't know, Julia. You, don't know. <laughs> you know what? I was thinking while you're saying it, I know something. I think this is the only book that either one of us set in Scotland. Are any of the Bridgertons or anything else set in Scotland? Yeah, I've done Scotland. Sorry. Oh, this is my only Scotland. So. I haven't done much. So I, I wrote a book. Called, well, I had an anthology called Scottish Brides. So that was set actually in Gretna Green. Uh -huh. So just over the border. And then When He Was Wicked is set partially in Scotland, but also just over the border. I haven't done like Highlands or anything. Right. Well, this is my only Highlands. And we had fun writing this. Remember, we've got we've got a irascible laird and a snowstorm that keeps everyone locked in the castle. And it was a lot of fun to write. That was a lot of fun. I know we need to do that again. And it, I know it's I'm the I'm the reason we haven't. It's my turn to come up with the plot, and I haven't because I'm I'm fundamentally lazy. Um, <laughs> but I would love to hear. Without I mean, I would say without putting you on the spot, but totally putting you on the spot. Like if you could talk about how you see the difference between Georgian and Regency, since you've, you've done both quite a bit. Um, and I think for a lot of readers, they can't necessarily differentiate right. that well the difference. I've done one series set in Georgian times, but I honestly felt like you don't, especially because mine aren't set like in London. Um, mm -hmm. My Georgians aren't, in fact, one is even in New York. Um, I don't feel like they give as much of a sense of the difference as your books do. So. Well, for me, I mean, I, I like, um, I, I like costumes, right? I like clothing. I like fashion a lot. So of course in the Georgian period, you have huge wigs, you have huge dresses, you have all kinds of disguise of the female body, which is super interesting for me. Um, because it gives you a million storylines right there, right? You, the, a wig in itself is a storyline. Uh, uh, like I had a woman drowning in the swamp and then I was able to save her because she was wearing a cork bum underneath her dress. That's the kind of details I love. I read about a cork bum and I'm like, oh, I have to drown someone almost, except she won't drown. Because that's the kind of brain I have. Like I read about a wig, um, you know, and they used to glue in the feathers and then put powder on. And the only thing I could think is allergy. That would give you an allergy. And then you would never have an orgasm because you're sitting up in bed with your wig on. So yeah, that one was um, the Christmas book. I, I, I remember that, that the whole that wig thing. Anyway, I like those. Christmas. Yeah, fair before Christmas. I like the history is different. So when you get to the Regency period, it's a pared down female body, right? You're, you're virtually naked. And, and there are pictures of women who are naked from the waist up, like at the opera and so on. So we have this diametrically opposed view of how the woman's body should be adorned and how it should be um, sort of displayed, which is really interesting. But also there's a difference in the relations between men and women that I find really interesting in the Georgian period among the nobility and the gentry is a lot more arranged marriages and a lot of people living apart. 
and you raised your own, your husband's bastards right along with maybe some children who are definitely don't seem to be his, you know, there was a lot more of those large households and much less animosity connected to adultery. So um, when you get to the Regency period, you know, we're heading towards the Victorians, right? We're not in the Victorians, but we're heading there. So relationships are becoming much more tamp down. And if you look at um, what we saw in the Brid in Bridgerton, for example, in the series, I thought they did a wonderful job of showing just how much a young woman's life is circumscribed by the season, by what she's allowed to do, or what might happen when she's alone. That's much less likely to happen in the Georgian period or a lot of women that were going to the altar pregnant and maybe not with the guy they were marrying either. So I really like playing around with those things. Um, I just think they're really fun. I'm going back to the this one, let's just see, this one coming out on Tuesday is the last Georgian one in the Wild series. So it is in the country, it's not set in London, but it's a lot of fun. She wants to be, she wants to act Hamlet on the stage dressed in boys clothing. I am part way through that one right now. I, I, have, oh. I, I am very much interested in Lady Bum Trinket. <laughs> Lady Bum Trinket is one of my favorite characters. I, I, you know, it was one of the things I'm reading, and I thought only Eloisa would name a character Lady Bum Trinket. But before I forget, somebody has a question for you. What is the title of the Cork Bum book? The Cork Bum book. Oh my goodness. Okay, wait a second. I have to look here. I have to look. Okay, at if anybody page. in the audience knows, um, yeah, somebody will Actually, know for fun. sure. Can the audience come up with it faster than you can? <laughs> Probably, almost certainly. Um, I think, I think it's Weld in Love. Actually, is it Weld in Love? Someone tell me. Anyone? They up? haven't said anything yet. Although oh. somebody says they need to name a small animal lady Bum Trinket. <laughs> There's a thought. I mean, it's a fabulous name, right? And Lady That's Bum great. Trinket comes right into the dining table. My heroine is um, been fencing actually fencing because a very, very uptight Duke is teaching her how to do the sword scenes in Hamlet. And Lady Bumtricket comes in and says, well, you know, you're a bastard to my heroine and you're a Duke who's in trouble. You can't possibly marry each other. And of course that's absolutely true. Yeah, I mean, yeah, ladies- Isn't that how we all got here. married on a dare, right? Yeah. What? <laughs> I'm saying, isn't that how we all got married on a dare? You know, uh, like, No comment. Here? Okay. <laughs> Um, so I also want to remind everybody here, well, this doesn't apply to Denny because this is her first book, but that Joanna and Eloisa both have very rich and lengthy backlists. So you, and you can order, um, their other books from the university bookstore. If there's a book you want to buy from them from the university bookstore and you don't see it there, you can probably email them at books at ubookstore.com and say, I would like to purchase this book by Eloisa James. Can you get it up in your catalog? And I think they will. <laughs> they kind of have to now because I said this. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, even though like, you know, this is, oh, I thought the sermon said, oh, okay. I thought that was the book for me. Like, oh, okay. But yeah, so it's just, you know, even though at these book signings, you know, people are promoting usually their most recent book. Um, they have wonderful books. Um, many other ones. And so I was actually going to, I thought I'd talk a little bit about like how I discovered each of yours writing. Um, I already told the story about Denny's. Um, for Joanna, it was um, kind of halfway, a little bit just because like Sarah McLean was getting so annoying about it. Like she kept talking about how great your books were. Um, <laughs> that and me well, how I found out too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's, she's, she's just like, Joanna Shoop, Joanna Shoop, Joanna Shoop. I'm like, fine. Like I got to shut this woman up. And so, um, I, I bought one on my Kindle, which is which is actually my read on my phone, but it's actually my phone. Well, so I go, I know Eloisa knows about this. Um, and this is one of the saddest things about quarantine is that I haven't been able to do my, my trips. I go to Mexico for a week by myself to write. And I usually do this two or three times a year now. I started out like once a year and it's so good that um, I go more and more and I have not been able to do that. It's been very sad. So this one time I went and I made the mistake, I'm not supposed to read books for fun on these trips, but I, I think I'd had like a really successful day. So I decided like as a treat. And so I picked up or, you know, tapped into a Joanna Shoot book and I ended up reading like four in a row and got nothing done for two days. And I was very sad. 
Um, <laughs> sorry, not sorry. <laughs> I think it was. I'm, I can't remember what it was because part of me thinks I read like those the, the Magnet series first, but like in my head, I'm picturing like notorious arrangement which were those were your first ones for avon right yeah a daring arrangement a scandal daring steel arrangement. and, and a, a notorious bow sorry i'm like doing a mishmash i'm like djing your titles here right. um, <laughs> totally fine <laughs> so anyway i can't remember but that so there is that and then with eloise's book i remember when her first book came out uh, which was potent pleasures it was um uh it, it, it was a big deal when it came out because she, you got, I, I have no idea how much you got on like your end, but like to the rest of us watching in romance land, it was a very big deal because she got this great deal with, I think it was Delacorte, which doesn't exactly exist anymore, but they were publishing her books in hardcover, which did not happen. And we were all like, who is this woman who's got a hardcover deal? Oh my gosh, I have to find out what's going on. And then, you know, I was reading your bio and I found out you had gone to Harvard and I also went to Harvard. And, you know, so I felt like, like this kinship. So I was like, well, I should read this woman's book. And it was one of those ones where I read it. And like the very first line, I was like, oh my gosh, she's so good. And it was something about I can't, I don't have it here, but like it's how somebody could remember, place their life into like two pieces, like a ball that came apart before and after. Am I getting it right? Yeah, yeah you got it right. Yeah, I mean, just not as well, but it was one of those things where I read the first line and I thought, she is so good. Aw, thank you. And then I remember I came up and introduced myself. I was like, I'm just, I just want you to know I'm a big fan. <laughs> um, okay, hold on. I have a message here saying, one of the honors wants to know if there's a way for them to write you to ask a bit more about your books, if you give me the best way for people to come. Oh, oops, never mind. She's like, I'll say it during the answer to that question. Um, so actually, why don't we just do this now? Whoops, like I'm totally, obviously I'm not good at this Zoom thing because I'm like reading the direct message out loud. Um, but so for me, in terms of contacting me about books, um, I no longer have an email link on my website. Um, I took that off probably five or eight years ago or something, because I realized that it was taking me so long to answer um, that I would rather not get the email than not answer it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, you know, I, I hate the thought of somebody emailing me and me not answering them. And it, it was just starting to take so long. So the best ways to be in touch with me um, is to visit my social media, which is um, Instagram and Facebook. And I'm very active on both. I am not on Twitter. Um, so there's that. Uh, how about you guys? Same thing. I'm not on Twitter. Same. I'm on Facebook. I'm on everything. On Instagram. <laughs> um, but you can also email me at Eloise at Eloise at .com. It okay. does plop in with all of the disgruntled faculty members and unhappy students who are appealing their grade and all the rest. So it sometimes takes me a while to answer, but I, I do eventually get around to it. So <laughs> forgive me if I'm late, but I can get to you. Yeah. And um, Denny? Um, I'm actually on every social media platform that exists. I think it's from my um, marketing and PR days. Um, I have a tendency to enjoy it, but I also have a specific focus when I'm there. It's, it's, I, I'm rarely talk about any um, topics other than books mm -hmm. um, and or uh, coffee. But that's about <laughs> the two. I knew there was a reason I like you so much. <laughs> the two things but I I even posted on TikTok last night so wow. anything is possible I'm on TikTok too oh <laughs> see. mostly because I have a great undergraduate who's posting on TikTok for me <laughs> and Joanna what's the best way for readers to be in touch with you or in contact with you yeah same as Denny I'm on social media everywhere I'm either Joanna Shoup or Joanna Shoup author um on Facebook my website mm -hmm. joannashoup.com so yeah, yeah, I'm everywhere. I'm always Denny S. Bryce. Denny S. Bryce at Denny or Denny at Denny. I know I have to remember to put that initial in. I forget sometimes. I'm like all those I'm, other Denny Bryce's out there. <laughs> a few zillion Speaking of us. Speaking of which, oh my gosh, you want to hear my, so, and then we'll wrap it up because I think there are questions. Somebody published a book on Amazon. On, it's called A Question of Lust by Julia Quinn. Oh, yeah. So I'm just telling you all right now, that's not me. I don't, I don't, I don't know what's going on, but that's not me. Um, she should be Julia S. Quinn, you know. 
apparently there was this big um, plagiarism scandal. I don't know if you heard about it, but some woman had taken a lot of people's books and just mushed them together. And, and then, and I was like, well, I do not have enough time to go read her books and find out if mine, but then um, somebody wrote me and was like, hey, you should look at this interview because she's got your books on the, on the bookshelf right behind her. So I'm thinking, hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you're saying that. I, I was in actually that whole thing. You know, I, I, uh, I, I it was, know. yeah, it was crazy. Yeah, it wasn't good. It wasn't good, but it kind of fizzled and I haven't heard much about it, but we should wrap this up because I think Grace is going to hop back in uh, with some other questions from Hi, some other people. There she is looking, oh, lamb. look at you. <laughs> oh my gosh, I could listen to you guys talk all day, really. I don't even want to jump in at this point, but we do have some amazing questions for the audience, so I'm going to go through that right now. So the first question is, um, I think a general question, so all of you can answer, from Amber. It says, I'm an avid reader who has always had story ideas, but I hate the process of writing. I get overwhelmed. What made all of you start writing? Do you, did you enjoy it right away? So um, who'd like to start for, well, Julia, you haven't answered any questions all day. <laughs> I'm gonna just sort of kind of take part of that. And I wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I get variations of that question a lot, but I've never been asked, did you enjoy it right away? And I think that is such an interesting and smart mm -hmm. aspect of it. Um, because like I joke a lot that like I enjoy having written more than actually writing, which I think is a shared feeling sometimes. Um, did how did I get? I mean, I will say it was so long ago. How did I get started? I think it was just an outgrowth of my love of reading. I just I was reading historical romances um, for pleasure so much, and I just something in me and I, I have no idea what like pushed me over that watershed moment but something in me was like I want to try writing one and and I, I also want to be very specific because I often hear people say like I was reading and I thought I could do better and and that's a very valid thing and I'm sure we've all but it that wasn't my experience my experience was that I, I felt like I'd finally found some authors I thought were amazing and I just wanted more of that so it, it wasn't a question of like of, of just of being like, oh, I can, I can do better than what's out there. It was more like I had found like this sort of sub niche within historical romance of authors who are writing and adding a bit of humor and more and have more heavily on dialogue than description. Cause for a while it'd been very, very descriptive. And I was just like, I want more of that style. And so that's kind of how I got started. And I think, I think I did enjoy it right away, at least um, in a different way than I do now. I, I think that first books there's something very special about them. And if you read them, like, I think if you read my first book, which is called Splendid, which I, you know, when somebody else is answering, I can pull out a copy of it with the original cover and you can all be like, I can thank everybody who actually bought it with that cover. Um, I, I, if you read it, it's not nearly as polished as what I do now, but I think you can see a certain joy in it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you're, cause you're just out there like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm just going to do this thing. And you just kind of get it out there. And um, so, yeah, I think I did enjoy it maybe more than I enjoy it now sometimes, but it is overwhelming and it's really hard and it's really hard. You just got to get to put your butt in the chair and do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to let somebody else answer while I find that. that first Thank question. you. And Eloisa, how about you? Well, okay, I got to go on. Perfect. I'm going to follow up on what Julia said, because I loved writing my first book. It was great. I never took a creative writing class. I just like, blah, 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 whatever. And as she told you guys, there was this big fuss when it was made into hardcover. And then there were 9 million negative reviews. If you go look at Potent Pleasures right now, my first book, um, you'll see that the the people who've been writing a long time thought it was ridiculous that I got a contract. And so they, um, they, they were like these one-star reviews, none to be a five-star reviews. And I would sit there and cry. And I remember my husband coming in, kind of like yours, Joanna, and she, he was like, you know, I don't think you should look at Amazon anymore. And I was like, because I had never had a writing community. I didn't have, you know, I didn't join the IWA because it cost money and I didn't have money. So, um, so when it came to the second book, I had a lot of trouble. They were going on about POV, which 
I didn't even know what that was. It turned out it's point of view. I'd never heard of POV. So I had a terrible time and I was trapping myself and trying to be perfect and trying to make it so all these angry women would, would like me. I'm from Minnesota, we like to be liked. And I got an email from someone I didn't even know named Julia Quinn. Oh, do you remember that? She yeah. was like, you know what? I think you should just do what you're gonna do. Like do, you sent me probably the most important email of my career. That's amazing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cause okay, that was, that was wonderful. <laughs> Joanna? I didn't remember <laughs> people kind of picking on you and it was just because they were jealous. I was jealous. But like, I, I don't, I don't like when people pick on people because they're jealous. I only like when people pick on people because they're mean and you weren't mean. You, you were, anyway, you know, it was a moment. It was, it was, thank you. Yeah. Before we get going. So th this was my first book. Splendid. Oh, I remember that. Splendid. Book. That's the cover. Mm -hmm. I remember seeing the cover and being like, huh? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there's any single inch of England that looks like that. Now, what about his hand placement? I, mean, I was, that's where I was. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remain convinced to this day. And it's like far enough in the past that like, I can now say this without worrying that like my publishing house will get upset. But it's, I, I remain convinced that this was like, because Native American romances were still a big thing at the time, that, that this was some leftover painting they had. <laughs> and like they, they they like changed her into like a regency dress because this is definitely like kansas this is yeah. not england yes um joanna how about you um what uh, made you start writing and did you enjoy it right away i you know like eloisa and and julia that first book you're, you're not thinking about how it's going to be received or you're not thinking about reviews you're not thinking about critics i mean it is you write it it, there's a lot of joy in my first in my first book that got published um and then you hit sort of the second book and then that was really where I struggled I think that second book I rewrote three or four times which is very unusual for me um and so yeah there was joy in the first book but as long as you know I I think I published I think the heiress hunt is my 15th book so there are still moments of joy when you're writing. I mean, it's not all joy. I mean, it's definitely not all joy. And like Julia said, I much rather prefer to have written than be writing, but there are little pockets of joy that sort of keep you motivated, but there's no way to do it other than doing it. I mean, if there were, we all would, would know the secret. I mean, there's no other way to do it, but to do it, so. And you know, something you said made me think of, something like people always ask me like what's your favorite book that you've written and I'm always saying well I, I can't pick one you know and you know the you know, the stock answer is well it's like choosing my favorite child or something but the thing is is it's not so much that it's like for every single book there there's I don't use the word pocket but that's what it is there's a pocket of something in there that is very very special to me and it might be a character it might be a plot point it might be some experience I had while I was writing it that would not be readily apparent to the reader, but there's something about each one that makes that book very meaningful to me. So I can't, that's why I can't pick one. Yeah. And how about you, Denny? Um, I'll have to go back to fan fiction. One of the things that it was all joy writing um, a sh about a show that you loved, but we also did things where there was such a community involvement in writing online um, that you'd have prompts where you'd have to write something in a hundred words or less. And there was all these little games that we used to play that just made everything about writing fun. Um, once I started um, working on original fiction, um, this, I just love telling stories. I, I really love telling stories. Um, I love twists and turns. I love all forms of entertainment and artistry from music to art to dancing, to storytelling. So an opportunity to mix and match all of those things has always been exciting to me. Um, also Wild Women in the Blues is like my fifth or sixth completed book. <laughs> so um, I've, I've had an opportunity 
to really, because I'm, I'm a person who dug into the craft side of it uh, quite a bit. A craft junkie is what I've been referred to at times. But um, that experience was very exciting to me to have the opportunity to study writing because I became a book critic before I was published. Um, and that um, is also, uh, I, I attribute to the fact that I had an opportunity to always love the environment of the publishing industry, as well as the authors and the books that they were creating. Okay, thank you. So I'm gonna interrupt really quickly to say that we have a lot of questions. So if it's okay with everybody, authors, audience, I think we're gonna extend this for a little longer so we can go through some of those. So probably just, um, you know, five to 10 minutes longer than we were supposed to because there are some wonderful questions here. We wanna make sure everybody gets to answer them. Okay, so the next question is, um, how are you introduced to romance literature? Laura says she was given a Harlequin in fifth grade from a resident in a nursing home where she volunteered. So we'll start with Joanna. <laughs> Uh, my grandmother, my, uh, my grandmother and my mother were both um, huge romance readers. Um, my grandmother was reading romance till the day she died at 102. Um, mm -hmm. Sabrina Jeffries, I mean, she devoured like everything Sabrina Jeffries ever wrote. Um, my mom reads all of my manuscripts first before anybody else sees them. And I frequently get notes from her like there's not enough sex in this story. So, um, yeah, so my, my, my mom and my grandmother. <laughs> and how about you, Eloisa? I love that story, Joanna, because I must say my mother was not along that bent. I gave her my first book and she said, you know, I don't read that sex stuff. And that was the end of that. But, you know, <laughs> she read a lot of Tolstoy, so I can see where she was coming from. Um, and he didn't go past the bedroom door, as it were. I got mine from my grandmother read um, Barbara Cartland and she had those Barbara Cartlands hanging around. And, but, you know, I think for me, really, it was, it was what we now call YA romance. So, you know, even Charlotte's Web has got a little romance in it because Fern goes up on the, on the Ferris wheel. She's asked by a boy up on the Ferris wheel. So for me, I could find romance anywhere. It was the only thing I was interested in reading and it mm. was everywhere when you look. Julia? Um, I remember my my grandmother had a subscription to Good Housekeeping and they used to have abridged novels in there. And uh, they were almost all either what we call women's fiction or romance. And I, I seem to recall there being like a Kathleen Woodwiss in there. So I, it must've been heavily abridged because Kathleen Woodwiss novels are thick. Um, but I remember, I guess whenever we would go to her house, I would always be reading the novels that were in them. And eventually my grandmother gave me a subscription to Good Housekeeping. I think it was only the only 11 year old in the world with a subscription to Good Housekeeping. But um, that, so I was just reading them there. Hmm. Um, I lost the sound. Can you all hear me? Oh, hear you. oh okay, good, good. Um, okay, so this is gonna sound like crazy pants, but my first romance was a category romance written by Laura Kay. So that's sort of recent. <laughs> um, uh, before that, my reading um, was primarily historical fiction, primarily um, gothic. I, you know, I thought Wuthering Heights was a romance. Um, you know, I, I really ha hadn't been exposed to romance until a friend of mine in fan fiction who turned out to be a member of RWA introduced me to romance. And that was in 2000, well, we won't go back about years, but it was a while back. At least I was able to say 2000 and something. <laughs> and while we have you on, Jenny, um, so Amber asks, and I know you have um, a novel set in the jazz age, but Amber asks, how come in romance, we do not have romance novels set in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s? I've always wanted to read a good classic romance novel set in those eras, but can't find any. Why is that? And I'll start with you, Denny. Okay. Well, this goes back to my exposure in the romance world. And, and some of it, uh, Joanna uh, talked about, because Regency uh, romance has dominated romance for decades. And um, 
I am seeing now more and more stories that are romance, are that are romance books that are venturing into different time periods. That is partly because um, I feel the publishing industry is open to that um, because there was a resistance to um, having more stories told outside of um, what was the most popular historical romance category, which is Regency. So I think you're going to continue to see on the romance side, more and more stories told, because um, what was history, historical means 50 years ago, the older we get, the closer it gets. So um, you're going to definitely start seeing more of these stories. While on the historical fiction side, uh, many um, historical fiction of the ones that I love the most are former romance authors, which is an interesting, like you look at um, people like even uh, Christian Hanna. I, I, years ago, I did a report. I was involved with RWA quite a bit. And I did a, a report looking back at all of the Golden Heart um, people um, all, you know, finalists or winners over the years, and that's an RWA, it used to be a contest for authors who were unpublished. And Christian Hanna was a winner back in the day. And so Christian Hanna, Kate Quinn, Stephanie Dre, Laura Kay, Laura Camon. I mean, all of these folks, a lot of folks got their start uh, writing some fabulous romances, so. Anybody else have anything to add to that? Uh, oh, I will just say that I, I think that uh, Jane Austen has a lot to do with it. Uh, Georgette Hayer has a lot to do with it. Uh, those novels are so beloved and so prevalent that people, I mean, you know, they just associate those time periods. I will say that I have had people say to me, um, I won't read anything set. I've had readers say, I won't read anything set in America because I can't, uh, I, I can't romanticize it the way I, I would things set in America. America's too real. So maybe that's, you know, part of it too. I don't know. So my, my thing is actually very similar to what Joanna said, but rather in, ter in terms of place, it's more time. Um, I do think there's something to the fact that, you know, Regency had all these sort of uh, the foundation already laid with Austin and everybody like that. But I think to me, at least a bigger thing has less to do with the, the domination of Regency than the fact that if we get too close to where we live now, it is harder for people to romanticize it. Mm -hmm. uh, I think one of the reasons Regency is so popular, because um, I, I get asked a lot, why is Regency so popular rather than why does it dominate? But um, is that it's far enough in the past that we can romanticize it. We can give it a fairy tale quality. Um, but at the same time, it's modern enough that people think in ways that it's very relatable. Um, I, you used to sit, people used to say like, you can't do some stuff in the 20th century. It's just too close. People have, have relatives who were alive who, you know, if you set something during the, you can romanticize the no, Napoleonic Wars in a way that we can't seem to romanticize World War One yet. Um, it's just, it, it's too connected. And I think, you know, as we move farther away from these times, we're starting to like let in, like suddenly the Gilded Age, Gilded Age is like, Joanna's not the only one who's writing there now. I mean, there are other authors. And so I think, you know, as we move away from these times, more of these times will seep in, but, um, yeah, people just don't seem to be prepared to romanticize these time periods just yet. There is nothing to add. Eloisa, did you have something to add to that? Or, or did no, they, did I'm, they I'm say? Curious. I'll just say that I think that Bridgerton, the series, is going to lead to probably more regencies. Um, I, I was sitting around with my daughter yesterday and we're kind of halfway through house and she was like, I just want more Bridgerton. And I, I think it is getting solidified in the minds of young people yeah. as an escapist era that, you know, has those attributes we're talking about. There have definitely been a lot of articles and, you know, places like BuzzFeed or Refinery29, things like that being like, you finished Bridgerton, what else can you read? You know, other authors. Um, which I think is really nice. Um, 
I'm hoping that it will bring more people into the historical romance fold. One thing that I think is really funny, which is kind of had me laughing is that I, I feel that the television series, one thing it did really, really well is capture sort of the, the set of emotions that you get when you read a romance novel. Mm -hmm. I mean, they really do have the arc of a romance novel over those eight episodes. And, you know, there are other things going on too, but it's the first mm -hmm. filmed thing I can think of that truly gets that. Um, I mean, the, the Hallmark movies do have room, but that's what the category room, it, it's not quite the yeah, same. Different. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and you get all these people who are like, suddenly think like, wow, I really like this. I wonder if there's any other type of like media entertainment that gives me this set of emotions. And like, I'm like, yeah, that scream you just heard were like a thousand romance authors going, yes, <laughs> we have books for you. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that it will lead to more people discovering more, more romance. I mean, it certainly has led to a lot more people discovering my books. That's for sure. Um, but um, eventually they got to finish mine and move on to other people, so. Here, this one's from Connie. What's your favorite scene in a romance to write? The almost kiss, the meet cute, the big romantic gesture, sexy times, et cetera. And we'll start with Joanna. Um, I'm laughing because I, I, I always say like in panels that uh, the sex scenes are my favorite to write. I mean, those are, like I live to write the sex scenes. I like roll up my sleeves and crack my knuckles and I'm ready to roll. Um, so yeah, for me, it's always the sex scenes. Eloisa? I, I like writing funny scenes. So sometimes sex can be very funny. I've written a lot of bad sex, it's very funny. Um, but I, I like writing the scenes that make me laugh when I'm writing them. And it's not that easy. It's not like they just happen. Sometimes it can take you know, six, seven, eight, 14 revisions of a scene before I'm like, okay, I like Lady Bum Trinket now, you know, <laughs> it's gonna work. <laughs> so those are my favorite. I will say that sex is fun to write because it writes fast, faster for me than dialogue. How about you, Denny? Um, in thinking about Wild Women in the Blues, um, I do have a romance subplot and the, there were two scenes that were fun. <laughs> the scene where um, they first meet. So would it be described as a meet cute? It's definitely a meet and someone thought it was cute, but I don't know. And it's a meet cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, so everyone um, will just have to buy the book and read and decide and for just, themselves yeah. and let you know. But I really do, I platform. really do enjoy meet cute. So, I mean, even when I'm reviewing, because I review a lot of rom-coms, um, and a, a good meet cute just snaps you into the story right away. And I, I, I kind of love those. And I also love authors who say they enjoy writing sex scenes. Thank you. <laughs> How about you, Julia? <laughs> hey, you know, I like lots of different things, but one, it's kind of odd, but so, I don't know if this is like an overall, this is the type of scene I like best, but some of the scenes I remember really enjoying writing are not necessarily ones between the two protagonists, but ones between the protagonist and a secondary character, or I've written some group scenes that I have really loved. Um, like I think the most famous one is the Paul Mall scene in the, the Viscount Who Loved Me where they're playing, you know, it's, it's basically croquet and it's practically a blood sport. And like, I, I haven't read the scripts yet for season two, but like fingers crossed that that shows up. Um, or there was a scene in um, The Secrets of Sir Richard Kenworthy where these girls are putting on a, it was supposed to be a poetry reading, but it ends up being like a performance of an original play called The, uh, the Shepherdess, the Unicorn and Henry the Eighth. Um, and it's just a complete farce. And I just, I had lots of fun with that. Um, those made me actually, if I giggle when I write it, I'm, I'm pretty pleased. Okay. But definitely I've had some scenes like mother daughter scenes um, or, you know, female friendship scene where, where, where the, one of the main characters I think is learning something about themselves, but not through the love interest through someone else. And I've, I've really enjoyed a lot of those too, um, because I think that it's important to show that these people are whole and that they exist without their love interest. Um, I, I always wanna make sure the characters I write, you know, make it clear like, you know, the people like, I'm nothing without you. I, I, I don't know. I want people who, who are something without the other person. They're just better together. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that helps show that. It's a good way to put it. Yeah. So Eloisa, this is just for you. Um, when your students discover who you are, do they start fangirling all over you? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> what, is the, what is the reaction? What usually happens? They say, my mom said, if I went to Fordham, I had to take your class or she wouldn't pay for it. <laughs> Things like that <laughs> happened. Or can I, because I've written a Shakespeare series, so I'm pretty sure I'll get it like for this one because it's got Hamlet in it, right? So I say, um, I want extra credit. If I write extra credit on Hamlet as you portrayed it in Wild Child, can I have extra credit? I'm like, no. <laughs> I, I pretty much ha I do have two lives. I'm like, I'm Professor Bly and I switch my Zoom. And then I'm like, I'm Eloisa James. And yeah, you know, this has been a really hard time for students. For those of you who are students or who have students, it's a really hard time for kids in college. So yeah. I can't wait till we're back in a room together because it's so much of a better experience and a warmer experience and and you're more free maybe to joke around if but it's Eloise or whatever, but now they're just sort of like this all the time. Mm. Um, this is just a comment, but I'll read it out. So Julia, this is from Margie. She said she joined a virtual Julia Quinn book club, which starts tomorrow spanning oh. eight time zones. So oh, eight yeah. time zones. And the prerequisite is that our favorite hero is Michael Sterling. And the group wanted her to say hello and tell you that they adore you. So just oh. a comment. <laughs> you, Margie. Margie's very active on my Facebook page. I know Margie from there. Um, and, just, and this is also my, my call out to everybody like, please, yeah, join like the face. The, I do different things on Facebook and Instagram. They're not like carbon copies of each other. So join both and we have a lot of fun. So I'm just going to have time for two more questions. Um, and so this one's from Katie, um, says for Julia, uh, she's a doctor and knows that you went to medical school as well. Did you realize briefly. that you didn't? Yes, briefly. <laughs> Did you realize you didn't like the field of medicine as much as you thought, or just that writing was the thing that brought you joy? And after you answered that, all of the other panelists, um, were there other careers that were also in your consideration? Um, you know, I think that I, it, was, it was a little of both. I think the bigger thing was that writing was a better fit. I think that if I had never discovered writing, I would have stayed with medicine and I would have had a very fulfilling career. I mean, think, um, but one thing that I did have difficulty with, um, during my brief time in medical school was the feeling that you, you were just never caught up just never caught up. You could, you could just, you could never, I mean, there's always more research. There's always more something to read and do and whatever. And that was tough for me, at least with books. I mean, I'm generally behind, but like once a year I'm caught up when I turn that book in, like Eloise, you turn a book in on Friday, she's caught up. <laughs> she won't be for long, but right now she is. Two um, months late, but caught up. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's fine. you're caught up. Um, but yeah, I think it was more writing was was the better fit. And 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 now, you know, looking back, I am married to a doctor. Um, so I know exactly what I am missing. And we all in this household believe that I made the correct choice, especially this year, because um, as most of you know, my husband is an infectious disease specialist. So this has been a particularly brutal year in our household. He is mm. uh, he is exhausted in every way a human being can be exhausted. Uh that's I have to say, um, since, you know, we have a lot of people here, I notice who are actually from the Seattle area who are probably, you know, regulars at the U bookstore. You, he, he's on the local news, like all the time now. Um, he's one of the, the favorite uh, people for, especially Tammy Mutasa, who's a uh, Como, Como? Como reporter. Um, I think once the reporters find a doctor who can speak really well on camera and is very articulate, yeah. that they, mm -hmm. they sort of were like, get, get him again. Um, and so like whenever he does an interview for somebody other than Tammy, we're all like, you're cheating on her. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, but this is my, this is my uh, appeal then like to everybody, please, you know, continue to wear your masks. You have to wear your mask even after you get your shot, please get your shots. It's important. It is nobody's microchipping you. Um, no, it's it's safe. It's I'm 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 halfway there. I'm very excited. Um, but yeah, like let's we need to do this. You know, protect yourself and protect your community. It's not like don't be selfish. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for all of that too. All right. Um, so I have no, to, that I is have that, to get on very my important. This is what this is the time we live in. So um, Joanna, how about you? 
Yeah. Um, I have all kinds of like marketing, advertising, and PR in my background. I went to uh, college on a, a, as a journalism major and thought I would go to work for ESPN as a sports journalist. Um, so that didn't really pan out, but, um, but yeah, writing's my day. I have a day job writings. I fit it in when I can. So yeah, marketing and PR, that's sort of what I do. Mm -hmm. Eloisa? Yeah, I well, we already you. know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I just um, want to there... say that we're chatting on the chat with a bunch of people who are um, either nurses or, or medical people or unable to be in college. And uh, I think we, we all are sending you all good support. Thank you for all the work you're doing and you'll be back in college. So this year, this too shall pass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I will share one before Danny answers, just one funny thing about my, my COVID shot. The first one I got, it was on the grounds of the Southwest Washington State Fair. So mm -hmm. I literally got vaccinated in the dairy and beef pavilion. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Like, am I covered for mad cow now? <laughs> <laughs> it was so funny. We drove, it was one of the driving things and we drove past the, um, uh, the 4-H barn. We thought we were going to be in the 4-H barn, but no, we were in the dairy and beef pavilion. <laughs> right, but that is a, that's a good story. Yeah. <laughs> Danny, how about you? Okay. You well, you to... also, I know you also have um, <laughs> this exciting career, two careers, but is there anything else that you were? Um, you well, were actually I had four careers. Thank so you. I started as a professional dancer. Then I went from that to being a media spokesperson for corporate, for a top 10 corporate entity. And that meant a lot of camera time, um, me talking about, you know, bakery closings. And then I was ran my own business for a while, a marketing and PR business. And then I started my writing career. Um, I would say, however, that the one thread that goes through the entire time is that I was always writing. So um, I finally decided to stop running my business and, and seeing what I could do with the writing career because I couldn't do both. I, I just couldn't do it. So I stopped that about full time about four or five years ago. So. Thank you. And this is our last question. Um, this is from PJ. I just read a historical set in Italy. Do any of you have a dream location or era you'd like to write in but haven't yet? And we'll start with Eloisa. Well, I have to say that my first novel as Mary Bly is coming out this summer, set in Italy. It's set in Elba, which is an island off the shore of Italy. And um, I always wanted to write there, but you know, it just didn't work with the Regency period. My husband's Italian and we've gone every summer for 20 years and we took our children to Elba. And so it's, it's like um, the island is a friend of mine and I love the food and I love the characters I created. So that's Lizzie and Dante in case anyone wants something set in Italy. It's coming out June 1st. Sounds amazing. Um, how about you, Denny? Any dream wow. locations? Well, I have dream locations, but I've been there, but I definitely want to go back. Um, dream location is Maui. I love Maui. I want to just be there. Um, in terms of writing, um, I'm working on a novel now, or should be, um, that uh, takes place in the Victorian era uh, and I'd love to have visited Nigeria during that time period. Mm -hmm. Well, actually it wasn't Nigeria at the time, but West Africa. Thank you. And Joanna? I'm so intrigued. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, for me, the Gilded Age in New York City is like the dream time period to set books in. So I, there's no other time or place I ever want to write. I may have to, fine. Um, I'll, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get there, but I'm living the dream right now, so. And uh, Julia, we will end with you. <laughs> so I, I've always considered myself extremely fortunate that what I want to write happens to be the most popular period in historical romance, which is the Regency. And, you know, I, and I've done a little bit just before the Regency as well. Um, 
I think the only thing I've sort of like toyed around in my head with is like maybe creating my own country. Ooh, like, yeah. <laughs> because I thought it'd be kind of fun to like create your own country and like create your own sense of royalty. And then, then like, I can't get anything wrong, right? <laughs> I mean, yes. if I like, I get to make up all the rules. Um, and so I thought that, because I thought it'd be fun to do like something with ro- like a royal romance, but you know, that, that gets tricky in the Regency because then you have actual people. Like I, I, it doesn't feel right to just like make up like some random extra princess of England. I mean, if she didn't exist. Um, so, or I should say princess of Great Britain. Um, so I've, I've always toyed around with maybe the idea of making up my own country somewhere. Yeah. Sounds to me, um, Julia, like you have the idea for our next three-way book. Oh, <laughs> yeah, but then like, if I do that for us, then like, do I get, can I use that later? I have to, <laughs> I might be greedy and right. <laughs> <laughs> mm, Sounds like some good collaborations coming up. And we're so excited um, for all of your projects coming up, all of your books right now. And as I mentioned uh, before, you can purchase any of the author's books using the links that we provided in the chat. And if you see something that you don't um, you don't see up on our website just yet, just give us a call and we will be happy to get that ordered for you. So I want to say a huge thank you to Julia, Eloisa, Joanna, and Denny for this wonderful mm-hmm. presentation, which is probably our longest event to date because we just don't want to say goodbye. <laughs> and I'd also like to thank our events and mail order team for all their hard work putting this together and a special mention to our behind the scenes staff during this event, Megan and Brendan, who are handling the tech so expertly. And of course, a huge thank you to you, our audience today, for spending this little bit more than an hour with us here at University Bookstore in the company of other book lovers and some fabulous books and authors. Um, This event is recorded and it'll soon be available on University Bookstore's YouTube channel, so you can watch it all the time. And um, we hope to see you back at one of our other virtual author events, especially the next Julia Quinn Presents, which is going to be sometime early in August. So stay tuned, follow us on social media, follow Julia on social media, and you will be notified. So thank you, everyone, for stopping by and have a wonderful weekend. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Julia. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) Bye-bye.